Stay on the first curve may be a mistake, but jumping too soon to a premature second curve can also get you in trouble. You have to balance the risks and rewards with the pace of change. Do you go the Steve Jobs route to next computer when he leaves Apple? What about when he goes on to Pixar? Next stumbles despite Ross Perot's help, Pixar makes Jobs a billionaire, albeit briefly, all over again. Be ready to jump, but don't jump too soon. Today's book was written from 1993 until 1995 and published in 1996, and it was way ahead of its time. It is a pleasure to welcome the author of that book, The Second Curve, How to Command New Technologies, New Consumers and New Markets. Ian Morrison, welcome to the show. Thanks, Aidan, for having me. It's great to be here. It's great to have you on the show, Ian. I was looking forward to having you on for such a long time. I thought we'd share maybe your origin story, how you ended up with that Scottish accent over that side of the Atlantic doing the work you're doing, including the work that you did with Institute of the Future and, of course, our mutual friend, Bob Johansson. Maybe you'll share all the mixing bowl of that experience and how you got to the book in the first place. I, I was joking earlier where we were saying that I was destined to be a futurist because my undergraduate major at Edinburgh University was geographic and economic change in Scotland, 1580 to 1830, which is incredibly useful. But really a useful training because I've been kind of a student of structural change in society for 50 years, I guess. And I did a graduate degree in urban planning, emigrated to Canada in the mid-70s and stumbled into healthcare. I, I, they hired me to work for a consulting group, internal consulting group, the teaching hospitals, because I had a planning degree, but I never really did planning. I ended up getting into sort of health policy and health economics. And coincidentally, was working on a project with a guy, John Tideman, who was on sabbatical at the Institute for the Future. People often ask, how did you get where you are? It was complete happenstance. And I met the folks at the Institute probably in 1979 and kept in touch with them. When I finished my daughter, I came down to work on a grant actually that John Tideman had gotten. And then he went off to work with Rupert Murdoch in Europe, setting up satellites and they had nobody on the health side to help them. And I ended up working and starting foundationally the health program at the Institute and then worked with Bob through that time and was president from 90 to 96. And then Bob took over and, and uh, he's been really the stalwart at the Institute through a long period of time, a great contributor to keeping what is an important organization still relevant, vibrant, and, and productive. And Bob's amazing at generating books every year. It's just incredible. But yeah, no, so I was there in the early 90s and mid-80s to, to mid-90s, a really fascinating time, Aiden, because if you think about it, and it's tough to, you were you probably in kindergarten then, but the, it was just the beginning of the commercialization of the internet. And we were in the epicenter of it. We had a number of people, Bob's group was looking at it, people like you know, clients like Apple and so forth. So it, it was a fascinating time, but we also had many other Fortune 500 clients who were going through their kind of struggles with globalization, with NAFTA, with the rise of Asia, with emerging economies, and a, a lot of clients who were struggling with consumer changes and shifts and attitude and behavior. So really what the book was a confluence of those three forces of changing demographics, changing geographic markets and changing technologies, conspiring to challenge conventional business models. And most of our clients were kind of fortune 50 or 100 companies trying to look over their shoulder. And our clients tended to be people who were strategic planners within those environments trying to look over their shoulder at what's next. So that was really the genesis of how we got there. And probably the cornerstone of the book is, is Amara's Law, my colleague and, and mentor, Roy Amara, who uh, was present through most of the 80s and 90s. Roy, wonderful guy, passed away several years ago, but Roy kind of codified this 
mantra of change that there's a tendency to overestimate the impact of phenomena in the short run and underestimate it in the long run. And in some senses, that is the genesis of the S curves. It is the basic truth behind forecasting. But that's how I came to it. Sorry, a little long winded, but that's how I came to be at the Institute and to work on these ideas. And really, it was the book was really a group effort of a lot of research, including Bob's group that was going on at the time at the Institute. And it was synthesis of these big forces and how they were challenging American and, and other global corporations. By the way, in 1995, I was uh, just finishing my secondary school. So I was 18. So I, I, we, I remember there was a computer room and none of us knew what it was. Like we were, it was just these fancy, it was apples actually, there was apples in there. And we didn't really know what they were, really know how to use them. And then over the next few years, it emerged in, in the slowly. As One of the things I, I just wanted to mention as well, because you were connected to so many of the people that we that created a lot of these models, including, for example, Everett Rogers as well. Maybe we'll mention him as well, because his models of diffusion of innovation were ov obviously a foundation to your work as well, of understanding first and second curves. Absolutely. And, and in fact, some of our colleagues at the Institute were graduate students of Ev Rogers. We, the Institute is in Palo Alto now, but was up, up the hill from where I am right now in Santo Road in Menlo Park and literally up the hill from Stanford. And so many of our colleagues were Stanford graduate students as, at one time or Berkeley. And yeah, no, Jeff Charles in particular studied with Ev Rogers. And, and I think What's interesting about that time is there were a number of research initiatives and popular books. If you think about Jeff Moore did a wonderful book about crossing the chasm. It was more focused on just the marketing dimensions of high tech. Andy Grove, the Paranoid Survive book. Of course, the great Clayton Christensen. And everybody was observing the same thing, I think, at the same time. It's not like we're all copying each other. It's just that I think it was a realization that this set of tensions were challenging the conventional business models. And a lot of it had to do with the diffusion of innovation. And that, that was kind of the core principle that we were trying to manage our way through. I mean, one of the things I, I thought was really fascinating is I love looking back at old interviews with, for example, Isaac Asimov the great futurist or the great sci-fi writer and, and stuff he said on, for example, the Letterman show in the 70s and 80s and how most of it panned out. Understanding when it would happen was the difficult thing, as you know, from being a futurist, but understanding the trends and generally where things were going was really interesting. And before we get into this book, I thought we'd share maybe what you have found interesting because I just want our audience to imagine that the books you read today that are similar to Ian's book, the books that are kind of trying to decipher where things will go in the future, maybe even Bob Johansson's book, because they're, they're, he's, he's prolific as an author putting stuff out, many futurists are, and how things panned out and what surprised you from the time you published your book and all the understanding you had back then, because knowing that and you sharing that is so useful because there's some stuff that you just dismiss and you kind of go, oh, yeah, that will happen, but it won't happen quickly. So I'm sure some stuff happened quicker than you thought and some stuff didn't happen at all. And some stuff is still struggling to be born. And I'd love you to share your observations on that before we get into the book. I, th I think that's a really good question. And let me just riff on a couple of, of thoughts in that regard. The one of the great insights comes from our colleague Paul Sappho's sort of 30 years Zen of change idea that it takes a lot longer than you think for an innovation to actually fully uh, map through. I spent most of my last 20 years really focused on, on healthcare. And this is a conventional wisdom in medical care that it takes about 17 years for an innovation in clinical science to actually make its way through the system, which is crazy when you think about it. But that's kind of been an observable fact. The curves can take longer. Other observation I make, and it's what I call, and, and this is a real skill that you can actually build a science around, I think, and through monitoring of the unfolding reality is to try and differentiate between what I call the median and the edge. 
when you see an emergence of a new phenomenon, is it really just an edge phenomenon where one or two percent crazy people are going to do it and it's irrelevant? Or is it going to become the median? And so that's the classic forecasting thing. Is this going to be mainstream? Is this going to be a big deal? And I've been, if I had made a methodological contribution, we really pushed in the 90s the use of partnership with survey firms to measure those emerging phenomena. And maybe we'll get into the Pitney Bowes example a bit in a second, but we did this in, we did this in healthcare. We did it in a lot of other areas where we essentially used real-time surveys to validate where we were on those curves, whether we were actually seeing the changes that we were predicting. And I think that's, I think now, as you read, as I look at sort of futures work, we're substituting surveys are helpful. We also have real-time data analytics that can be predictive as well. A good example in the COVID thing is, is the measurement of COVID and wastewater and sewage to determine the prevalence of the virus in municipalities. That's t- that is a central focus of our CDC and their ongoing monitoring of the COVID situation. Ian, before we get into, for example, you touched base on the idea of Pitney Bowes and how that was one that kind of surprised you with a company that was doing everything right, which is always the, I always have so much empathy for a company that does something right and maybe some shift in the market, some some crises that come out of nowhere that they can't control actually is what puts the end to them. Or it's just consumers, as you say, have changed preferences and moved on for whatever reason it might be. But before we even get into that, I thought we we should share the first and second curve and your definition of what they are, because just to bring everybody onto the same level onto the same playing field. So I'm going to share for those people watching us on YouTube, I'm going to share the Ian's slide from back in the day when he was giving talks on the first and second curve about this book for Institute of the Future. So on the screen now, you'll see the first curve and the second curve, and maybe you'll talk us through them, Ian. It's an embarrassingly simple notion, right? You're going along quite nicely on the green curve. It's the business, how to operate on a daily basis. It's where you make all your profit and revenue. And you have, however, a sneaking suspicion in your gut that it's going to decline in absolute or relative terms. So curve coming down might not be revenue decline. It might be growth rate decline or margin decline and be replaced by a second curve, a new business or a new way of doing business that is radically different from the first. Now, the dirty little secret of futurism is we cannot actually predict the future perfectly. And as we mentioned, the great Roy Amara's line, there's a tendency to overestimate the impact of phenomena in the short run and underestimate it in the long run. So you commit two types of strategic errors. You jump prematurely onto that second curve, walking away from all the profit and revenue that still is there to be extracted on the first curve. Conversely, if you don't start building the second curve, you're not going to be around later on in the 21st century, right? Because it takes a long time to build the competency and capability. And it turns out, I think, what I've learned in reflection now over 30 years since the book was written, it's extremely difficult for anyone to navigate successfully. It's pretty easy to be a disruptor, to be honest, if you strike the right mix of the magic uh, ticket or whatever, but it's much, much more difficult to manage that kind of transformation as an incumbent. And very few examples, I struggled even after the book was published and I would be invited to a lot of places to talk about it. It's tough to think. Perhaps the best, actually, current example, I used to use IBM as an example of people who had navigated the two curves almost like a double helix over and over again. Because if you think about IBM, back in the day, it was adding machines was the first curve and the second curve was mainframes, right? And then mainframes became the first curve and PCs was the second curve. And then PCs became the first, you see what I'm saying? And then consulting was the, the second curve. And IBM did a reasonable job of doing that. You could argue that the more recent example of success is Microsoft, who struggled as their kind of desktop package software by at once 
model was stalling out and went to software as service and now is basically building infrastructure and cloud and AI and doing phenomenally well. So it's not that it can't be done. It's just very difficult to navigate and still be around for the very long run. And like you mentioned, for example, IBM, and you also mentioned Microsoft being a possible threat to some of the dominant players at the time. You, so you, you kind of had seen that these trends were going that way. But I find it so interesting that even IBM were really early investors and trying to make sense out of AI. And they were at the table so, so early, probably too early, because this is the one of the things you say that you can be too early. And that being too early, you may understand that new technology may build up some competence or some capabilities in it. But you also may run out of energy. And the people working there understanding and having all that institutional knowledge may just leave the organization or go and join a startup or create a startup themselves. There's all these risks that are so difficult to see, even when you study these companies. Yeah, no, that, that is so right on. When I joined the Institute for the Future in the early 80s, they were experts on a lot of things. And Bob Johansson's group was leading this charge. The Institute actually invented email. They spun off a company called CC Mail, the first commercial email application. And it was really off of the work that, that the Institute's early days had done on communication with scientists on the ARPANET. But but when I joined the Institute, we, we, they, they were involved in a project to examine teletext and videotext, which was a precursor to the commercial. It was text messaging through your television, and it was thought to be a threat to newspapers and so forth. And to your point, the people who were most knowledgeable about it were, in fact, the newspaper companies who made investments in all of these things. And they knew all about it. And I think probably it's true to say that some of the frustrated executives, when the thing didn't pan out, probably went off and started some things. But the point being is, it wasn't that they didn't know about it. It's like the classic Kodak story. They knew more about digital photography than anybody else. It's just they didn't think it was as good as film. And they were too enamored with the quality of the first curve that they underestimated disruptive innovation, as Clayton Christian would say we'd call it, of, of digital photography. Then there's the whole mental challenge of the curve jump. It's a mental psychological jump, not just a technological one. There's a great line you have in the book, and you say almost every successful first curve business was a second curve business in its day. But I thought about that, and I was like, oh, but also many companies that find themselves at the, the declining phase of the first curve forget that they were at the early stage of the first curve as well. So they were like a startup and they had this entrepreneurial energy. And as as the organization is around longer and the executives are further and further removed from the origin story, they forget that kind of hustle and the organization hires different types of people. And Theodore Modis was saying the last day when he was on the show, he was saying that you end up hiring more bureaucrats and administrators and they're obviously less entrepreneurial as a result of that. So there's that whole challenge as well. I'd love you to share your thoughts on that. A good example, because one of the examples we talked about in the book, and I had to go back and remember, was Walmart versus Kmart, right? And I'd forgotten about Kmart. But I actually remember going to Walmart's office to give a talk uh, some years after the book was written. And it wasn't even about the second curve necessarily. It was about healthcare, ironically, because they... They were a big mover and shaker and as a purchaser of healthcare. But I don't know if you've ever been to Walmart's headquarters in Bentonville, but it is, and I, unless they've moved, it, it was in a thing that looked like a strip mall of dry cleaners in, in Bentonville. It's the most frugal headquarters. And I've been to, I don't know, 100 Fortune 500 company headquarters in my career, the most frugal headquarters ever. And that kind of the origin story, as you say, of frugality and low cost, delivering a better life to your, our consumers by low prices and a fair deal and superior logistics was in the DNA of Walmart and still is, I think. But it is very difficult to sustain that over a long period of time, to your point. And I think every, yeah, it's, I think it is fair to say that every first curve 
big giant company was the second curve company in its day. It took on the big guys. There, I forget the statistics. You may have it off the top of your head. But if you look at the Fortune 500 over the last 50 or 100 years, there's 12 or something that are still around. It's not a lot of the new players were born out of that second curve mode. I actually spent a day, it's a weird thing about weird people you've met in your life, like Michael Milken, the junk bond guy, and rode around with him for a day. And he, he was on speed dial with everybody from Larry Ellison to the Pope. I don't know. He seemed to be talking to somebody every two minutes. But the guy, incredibly smart, but, but he dropped this one liner on me about he started, I didn't double check or fact check, but that he basically, he and his colleagues financed 50% of the growth in jobs in the 1990s. You know, the second curve companies like Oracle. It's so difficult, man. I, I so feel sorry for those companies that were, were doing stuff right and just consistently bump into these new things. I find it's very like family businesses. The whole idea of it was Robert Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie, your countryman who said that shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. The whole idea is that the first generation of wealth in a family make the money. The second witness the struggle that they've gone through to make that money so they protect it. And then the third generation so far removed that they squander it because they've never experienced any struggle. And you go, that's the same model that happens to companies as well. So it's incredibly difficult to keep that story of struggle alive and the frugality, as you mentioned as well. But one company that you mentioned in the book and you knew this company firsthand, you knew the leadership in this company was paper-based Pitney Bowes. And they, as you say, they foresaw the internet and they didn't just see it. They knew about it and they invested, for example, 325 million in R&D from 1990 to 1992. So that's a hell of a lot of money in R&D because they saw what the internet could do to them. So they started to invest in the second curve while they're still riding the first curve. I'd love you to share the Pitney Bowes story. How it all happened is the chairman of our board was the lead outside director at Pitney Bowes and made the introduction. And we were brought into the fold. George Harvey, who was CEO at the time, who was very, I always describe him as he was a bit like your granny's accountant. He was a very low key guy, very smart, knew the business cold. And I remember sitting with him and, and saying, well, where do you think this is headed? And he said, look, I was through this when computers came out that digital would replace mail and it didn't happen. And in fact, we grew like crazy. And he said, I know in the long run, this internet thing is going to be the way in which we message, but I don't know how long that's going to take and what's going to happen to our business in the interim, because there is still an active mail stream. And he was convinced that he didn't want to prematurely abandon that, but he also was trying to build for the future. So he did a very smart thing, which was they identified the new CEO and then the group that was going to be that new CEO's staff, who were mid-level managers, worked very closely with George in, in, on a futures group. And we were staffing that. We were providing kind of consulting support to that. And those young, younger managers were getting the kind of historical, cultural, the DNA of the firm from George and all of his insights, while at the same time being prepared to take over as leaders in Critelli's regime. And if you look at the stock price through the 90s, when we were working with them, their stock went up to 60 bucks. It tripled or quadrupled because they managed that curve pretty well. They were throwing off a lot of cash. Mail continued to grow and they invested in newer technologies and services. They were one of the leading, and they also had a very strong balance sheet, which they leveraged with their financial services arm. And what really and what we helped them do was identify what was the primary drivers of the mail stream. And it's two things. It's bills and statements, right? Financial bills and statements. And it's direct marketing. And you could see how either of those two could migrate to e-commerce platforms. And they were extremely mindful of that. So we built a monitoring situation so they could measure that not only in the U.S., globally. And that worked out pretty well. I talked to Pratelli not that long ago and said, what happened? Because 
their stock price is way down now. It's about four or five bucks. I think I checked this morning. What happened? And the black swan event, even though they had done all these things correctly, was the recession of 2008, where apparently one of the big drivers was college age kids getting solicitations from banks for a credit card the first day of college. The, the banks did this routinely, but not in 2008 because they didn't want the bad risk on their books when the financial collapse happened in the 2008 recession. So it was kind of a black swan event that really did them in and perhaps they took the eye off the ball in, in terms of those transformations. But the point being was, if you go back to the initial conversation with George Harvey in 1990, was he was absolutely right. First class mail in America grew continuously until 2007, till that. And, and so walking away from 17 years would have been a dumb idea. But can you sustain a postage meter business in a digital age is still a very tough ask. And I just wanted to share a, a paragraph here from the book because you'll see the type of writing that's in the book here and how it speaks to that very thing. Ian writes, eventually every business has to face the second curve because it's caused by external changes over which a company has no control. And what this means is that the first curve investment is no longer enough. And the company must face very real and very complicated strategic dilemmas. Do you make the jump to the second curve? Is it a business at all? If so, do you jump now and risk losing your best customers and your solid first curve? If you jump too soon, you may be walking away from all the profit and worse yet, putting yourself in head-to-head -head competition with yourself or your best customers. If you stay on the old curve too long, you may never get a chance to play on the second curve. But when do you jump and how? And can you play both curves? That is a, an extremely interesting dilemma. And it speaks to, as you mentioned, Clayton Christensen's innovators dilemma. What have you seen there in the companies that managed and, and, and you see, this is where the empathy comes in. Pitney Bowes tried to do exactly that, manage the first curve while building capabilities for the second curve. And I wondered, did you have any companies that you observed over time or worked with that did this successfully and actually came out to write the history afterwards? As I say, I think the best success example currently is the one I give of Microsoft, you know, of navigating out of, uh, you know, they, they were obviously at the, the second curve going against IBM when the PC market. But, you know, in the early, up until about eight, eight years ago, they were stalling out. But then they did the, the kind of a restart second curve on software as service on the one hand for their desktop solutions but also massive investment in, in cloud-based infrastructure. And so, and that's what's fueling their success. And now AI as, as a platform for the future. But as I said earlier, in, I, I think it is extremely difficult in retrospect to navigate through. I have more failure stories than I have success, to be honest, that subsequent to the book, because I did a lot of talks over the years in a lot of different industries. I'll give you a couple of examples again, is insightful. One is the newspaper business, right? So it turns out, and it's sub-analogous to the mail business, newspapers, the finances of newspapers were predicated on classified ads in two or three categories, employment, real estate, automotive. All of those went away to digital sources and collapsed the finances. And again, the newspapers where they early investors in things that became the internet. And yet they, they got blindsided. My son was employee number 11 at Bleacher Report, which is classic second curve story of a sports-based website. And he was the guy, he's a product guy, and he was the guy that I've written books and articles and stuff like that. And, and this is the, a kid who was on the five-year program at the University of Arizona. And his, my wife was prodding him to go and get a job and he had, he got one interview and he became an intern at a Bleacher Report. And this was a sports website where basically the content was written by volunteers, right? Just random guys like you and me riffing about 
Manchester United or whatever. In the case, it was all American sports initially. But And so David one day came up with the top, a slideshow of the top 12 basketball shoes of all time. It got 200,000 hits overnight. And he and, and his colleagues built a product there that went from, I, I forget the numbers, metrics now, but it was like from a million unique hits a month to 100 million in the space of seven years. And they sold it to Turner Broadcasting. That's a classic disruptor in the newspaper space where a, you know virtually every local newspaper eventually saw a migration to other digital content areas than and away from their sort of original local journalism. Because you mentioned your son, I'll share that I actually was reading Ian's book and I noticed just a little th throwaway line you said, you were talking about personal second curves. So what are we doing on a personal level to build capabilities for the future for the second curve? And I thought that was interesting, given when you wrote it, so 30 years ago, at the onset of the internet, and people are going through that even to a higher degree today because of the impact of artificial intelligence on jobs, for example. And many people are fearful to go, what will happen to my children? What will they be working at, et cetera, et cetera. And that was something you thought back then as well. You went, I wonder what my kids will be doing today. Maybe you'll share what you shared with me when I asked you that question. I was concerned, obviously. And I, my son, as I say, has been a successful startup guy. He's on another startup that was successfully bought. My daughter w went to uh, uh, graduate school and uh, after a, a couple of years of what I called serial hippie jobs, where she was working and looking after rescue dogs in New Orleans and all that uh, crazy stuff. But she so, uh, got a, a master's in public health from UCLA in methods, epidemiology, basically, um, and applied that as a researcher in a uh, number of different healthcare organizations and consultancies. But she did re recently is she's now migrated over to a large media company as a user interface research leader doing user research. The point being, none of those jobs existed when I wrote the book. And those kids, I think, have benefited from, I think, a high degree of emotional intelligence and flexibility. And they're smart and capable and very hardworking. I, you're a rugby player, and I, I was a very bad rugby player in my youth, but I always told my son that you, you might not be able to be better than or faster than everyone else, but you can always outwork them. And I think that those verities are still true. I do share, I have two little grandsons, each of my kids have a, a baby, about a two-year-old, and in both cases, two, two and a half. And I worry a, a great deal about my grandchildren just for the long-run threat, not only of AI, I think there are even bigger existential threats from autocracy on the one hand to global warming. And these are real. And I think in, the, in my grandchildren's lifetime, we will have to deal with in a very profound way. But I think the lesson and reflection on the individual is flexibility, curiosity, uh, willingness to adapt to change as a core competency is something you've got to build up and the resilience to do that. Just as back in the day, we were kind of concerned that loyalty and sticking with the same job forever was going to be the ticket. That's not been the case. And I think self-reliance is important. And conversely, the ability to work in groups and teams as a kind of cornerstone going forward. Uh, they're great lessons, man. Absolutely brilliant lessons. I, I, it emerged to me that as well. And as I said to you as well, I'm sure they had a great teacher in you that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So that always helps as well. Those positive words of reinvention. And I also believe one of the things you mentioned about your daughter dabbling like that dabbling to me is essential to find out what you like, because if you don't go and dabble, it's like having a, an R and D lab where you're kind of messing around with technologies to see what would happen for these technologies, where are they applicable to you, et cetera. It's an, it's an important step, I think. And I don't think kids give themselves, kids, adults as well, give themselves enough time 
to discover what they like and what they don't like. And oftentimes they're following a script that they didn't even write. They're doing things perhaps they think their parents want them to do. And if you do that, it's a road to sorrow. Like you're going to climb the ladder and it's going to be against the wrong walls. I felt that when I read that part as well. And I'm saying that for a reason, because in the book, you talk about you cannot buy these capabilities. You have to walk the walk. You have to go through the pain in order to build those capabilities on a personal level, but also on an organizational level. You mentioned, for example, Sony and Disney and how one of these two leveraged existing know-how and their capabilities, while the other tried to buy progress, also said time. They tried to buy these technologies, tried to merge and acquire, etc. And it, that works out disastrously in a lot of cases. Maybe you'll share your observations on that Sony versus Disney case. I had to go back and remind myself about where we were in that time period and in the early 90s. Sony clearly had the had the electronics edge, if you like, and then try to buy its way in to the content piece. Whereas Disney, I think, was leveraging off of multiple platforms of content and consumer engagement that was uh, profound. And Sony, in some senses, got sideswiped by later on by the, the Apple uh, Music, original iPod, and subsequently the the move towards everything being on your phone. But yeah, no, I, I, I think this issue of can you buy your way onto the second curve is really an important lesson. And again, it's hard to see many examples where that paid off. I think it, to go back to the newspaper example, probably the best response to the digital substitution of newspapers has been the thoughtful way the New York Times organization has done it. And I don't know the numbers closely, but having just observed and it's been a while since I spoke to, I have over the years spoken to the newspaper association folk, but they were in dire, most, most newspapers can't survive unless they have a benefactor, Jeff Bezos buying the Washington Post for the, the change he found in the front seat of his car. <laughs> But the New York Times actually has done a pretty good job of building a digital second curve that is sustainable on a subscription basis, which is incredibly hard to do. And But all the others who try to buy their way into that have faltered, I think. So I, anyway, long-winded way of saying that this notion of we don't understand it, so we'll buy it, it, it doesn't often work out well. And it's part of the reason why, as I say, in com you know, it, there are more stories of successful disruption than there are stories of successful first curve to second curve transformation. It's a sad thing. And people think when you're telling those stories that you're scaremongering, but it's actually the case. And the other thing I find is there's a hell of a lot of humility with the companies who have survived. They're actually not resting on their laurels and going and telling everybody about those stories. So there's that part as well. Nobody gets a massive medal for just surviving and the company still hanging it. Yeah. One of the things I thought we'd share, and, and Ian's kindly going to give us a part two as well, because I haven't got through all the book either. And, and there's no way one show would do it justice. But one thing that I was really struck by a person we both knew and who had a dramatic impact on my mindset was D. Hawk, who kindly wrote the forward for my book. So I, I had such a, ma a massive amount of time for him. And it was the first time I read about this concept of the machine metaphor and how that was deeply embedded in organizations and how the language we use has a dramatic effect on how we even show up in the world and how we think about things. And there's a quote from your book that I'd love you to share because you had foreseen this as well back then. These, th this idea of a changing organization and the changing structure of an organization and how it had to be totally renewed was very prominent in your work and very prominent in your words because you wrote here, in the rapidly changing global marketplace, many businesses are finding that the tr their traditional organizations are more of an obstacle than an advantage in leveraging opportunities. Traditionally, organizations have been structured on models governed by mechanistic linear metaphors, such as the military style organizations of the early 20th century. Re-engineering 
is the ultimate mechanistic metaphor. These models worked well in regionally isolated markets with little competition, but now that the markets are global, dynamic and connected in a complex ecology of economic relationships, the old models are no longer effective. A classic second curve problem. I love that because that speaks to the problem that many people are living through today. And some of the things you talk about, you give a list of the different types of models that were being introduced to second curve models for organizational styles, for for example, fishnet organizations, which is a great term that I hadn't heard before. Maybe you'll share your observations there because your kids are working in these organizations now. you're seeing it happen in front of your very eyes. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And, and actually cre due credit to Bob Johansson and his team on, uh, cause Bob was really the originator of the, the fishnet metaphor. And the idea is that you, you pick up, if you, if you imagine a fishnet on a dog and you pick up a node on the net and a temporary hierarchy forms, and then you pick up another node and a temporary hierarchy forms. So that's the way many, like I was retained by Accenture in the late nineties as uh, chairman of their health futures forum. I ran a number of different kind of meetings and global get togethers for Accenture and Accenture, like many of the large global consulting firms are very much fishnet organizations, you know, that there is a hierarchy, but they're constantly reorganizing, which is part of their issue too, but around different ways of thinking. So you have industry specialists on the one hand, you have competency specialists, you have geographic specialists, right? And that depending on the project need and the client need, you pull together the requisite teams and capabilities and that is constantly changing and very fluid and that is kind of an organizational form uh for the future if you like and for the second curve and and, and i do think henry mintzberg the canadian business organizational theorist wrote sort of typology of organizations talking about on the one hand kind of simple mechanistic if you think about scale to what he called adhocracy, which is much more fluid. If you think about movies, it, you have a bunch of actors who come together, you have a bunch of crew, and it's plug compatible teams that uh, you do your gig and then you move on. And so a lot of modern contemporary business, it looks more like the movie business than our conception of the army. And ironically, and I'm sure Bob Johansson talks about this because he's worked with the Army War College and so forth. But ironic, and I've worked in, in my own practice with some of the leaders of the military, including Admiral McCraven, who I love, is, ran special operations. But, but you talk to these military leaders, and our notion, our non, those of us who never served in the military of hierarchy and order and all the rest of it, the contemporary military folk would say it's much more about fluidity and challenge and constant re reformation, albeit within a command structure. So even there, uh, they are, they've adopted these more fluid forms of organizational form. Ian, as a final part today, I thought because we touched on organizations and the mechanistic metaphor, etc, that we could use a table you wrote, and maybe you'll share the story of this as well, because this brought back memories to you as well. On the screen here, Ian wrote, differences between the first curve and the second curve. So one of the segments he covers is the marketplace. The second is organizations and the third is individuals. Today, we're going to on part one of this episode of this show, we're going to cover organizations. And then tomorrow, we're going to cover the market and then the individual as well. So Ian, we've already got stuck in here with the move from first curve mechanistic to second curve organic. And I'll let you take it on from here. Right. Thank you. And, the, the, you know, I, I, it, it, it's really uh, it sort of touched me when I saw this again, because it, it brought back vividly the morning. I, I was sitting in my, in the house I'm currently in, in my living room, and uh, I, either my editor or, or one of my colleagues at the Institute said, we really need a, a simple distillation of what's different about the second curve from the first curve. And I sat down and said, there's different ways you could think about it. One is the sort of overall market, the, the organization and the individual. And we'll talk more about the individual and the market. 
shifts uh, uh, tomorrow. But in terms of the organizational forms, yeah, we just talked about this notion of organizations who have more of a mecha- mechanistic metaphor behind them uh, versus organic. And I think that does play out. You, the, the, the models of many second curve enterprises, because of the nature of the work that's being done, are more fluid, they're more flexible, they're more self-organizing, as, as some people might say. The metaphors we use uh, to describe those organizations on a first curve tend to be more engineering or hierarchical versus more ecological or systems connectedness. And the units of analysis on the first curve might be more corporations. On the second curve, individuals and networks. So the metaphor of the movie industry, I think, a lot of contemporary businesses look more movie organizations that come together over projects rather than the corporate existing corporate structures. And then in terms of integration, the organizational forms that of the first curve tend to be more classic, either horizontal or vertical integration models of kind of command and control and putting the pieces together. Whereas virtual integration is really, you don't necessarily have to own things to cause it to happen. If you think about Apple, I always love, I'm a complete Apple freak. I haven't even got rid of my 15 power books. I keep collecting power books. And my it's do- hard to get rid of them though, man. Isn't no, it? I, it's, it's, where do they go? And she, my daughter came by recently and she said, dad, you have three power books on your desktop. How many are you using? I'm using the good one, the new one. But if you think about Apple, it says on the back of almost every Apple thing, designed by Apple in California, manufactured in China. And they don't own all these factories. It is really about virtual integration, not actual integration. And I think that lesson is incredibly important. And the the virtual, and, and we ran, we saw it, the weakness of it, I guess, in COVID where supply chains, we have done two things over the last 30 years. One is globalized our supply chain on the one hand, and the, the second is made it just in time, which is great, except if you have the source of a lot of that being Wuhan or whatever, shut down. And I know you've done a lot of thinking and work on supply chain stuff. That's a perfect example, I think, of how first and second curves have to, in some senses, work together. And then the final dimension of the organization thing we called out was, you know, and remember when this was written, there was an absolute kind of corporate mania around re-engineering and Charles Handy and, and those guys were preaching the language of business process redesign as the core of everything. Now, it's not that business processes don't matter. And if you talk to any second curve business, it's very much about process mapping and so forth. But, but the importance of culture and particularly kind of entrepreneurial culture on the second curve cannot be underestimated as uh, the, the kind of cornerstone. And, and I think, and I, I haven't thought about this empirically, but if you go back and say of those companies that survived and thrived through first to second curve transformation, it is probably in no small measure due to the strength of their culture to be able to sustain themselves. A company like Procter & Gamble, and I'm sure uh, Bob talked about that, he worked with them very closely over the last 40 years, is an incredibly strong culture. I work closely with Kaiser Permanente, the big healthcare organization. Again, it's a, it's a cultural phenomenon. And you can smell when you get into an organization, whether they have a strong corporate culture or not. And sometimes it's bad. The culture may be toxic, but, but in most cases, successful cultures are a key to enduring the long run. And as you say, you can smell it. You can, yeah, I really truly believe you feel it. You feel that energy or lack of energy, or you feel the bad energy that's there as well. It's speaking of which I felt great energy between us. So delighted that we got to spend this time together on this. And I'm so looking forward to part two. One last question for you is, you still have a website up there. You're still plowing out. You're still involved heavily in healthcare. Where can people find you? IanMorrison.com. I, I, unless somebody steals my name, I'm there. <laughs>
And yeah, no, I, I, as you say, over the last 20 years, I've focused pretty consistently on healthcare. And so people can find me on that topic, but it's refreshing to, to go back and look at some of the broader big picture things that we've been talking about today. It, it, it's been good fun. Absolutely. Look forward to part two. It's a pleasure joining you, author of The Second Curve, How to Command New Technologies, New Consumers, and New Markets in Morrison. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. That was great.